Happy Friday. Today we're going to have a little discussion that's different from making jewelry, although it has a lot to do with it. We're going to talk about when do you know if it's smart to repurpose a piece, like cut it up, or when you should maybe not do that. I've done other videos on that. I haven't done one for a long, long time, and I think the one I have to present to you today will help you out better than any of those did anyhow. I hope so. Um, you need to think about how you can make the most money when you find vintage jewelry. Because everybody needs more money to grow as an artist because you need tools. You need rents for shelves. You need tents. You need tables. You need business cards. I mean, just you, this is an endless stream of things that you need packaging. And it costs, and it's hard to get started, and you can't always get a loan for that. But what you can do is you can learn to pick vintage jewelry and resell it. And a lot of times you can find something for very little. You do a little research and you find out, oh, wow, you know, uh, that's worth a little bit of something. You know, I can make some money at that. And here's the deal, you know, if you have an Etsy or something and you have handmade things on it, you can make a section there for vintage jewelry. And handmade pieces sell real nice, really, really nicely alongside a vintage. I had a Ruby Lane store for a while, and I sold a lot of the stuff that I made, my major big pieces, but I also sold a ton of vintage jewelry there, too. It was a really good mix. And I've had other websites in the past that, that it worked out really well. Now now that I sell supplies, not so much. Supplies and and, and um, finished jewelry, then it's piecemeal. It's not a terrible idea, but it's not as good an idea as if you have finished craft jewelry, handmade jewelry, and vintage. So you need to find out which pieces are worth some money. And don't just say, oh, you know, that looked better on a cuff. Let me cut the back off and do it. Cause you might be able to sell it and make a whole lot more money selling it than cutting it up. So anyway, come on over to the table with me and I'm going to show you my collection of teaching pieces that I have for over the years that I use for my class that I teach on this subject. And I'm going to show you why they're pieces that you might want to leave as is and what you might be able to get for them. And another thing too I want to mention to you while I'm thinking of it, because we already shot that part first. Um, I'm really not here to help establish values on stuff, so guys, you know, if you want to approach me and ask me what's this worth, I can't do that for you. I wish I could. Um, when I'm talking, you know, in my class or in my videos or whatever, I can throw that out there, but I'm, I can't do appraisals for you, so you don't need to do that on your own, but guess what? Good news. It's not that hard to learn. Okay, and we do teach how to do that in the in the class that I have every summer. But there are other ways you can learn to do it too. You know, it's it's not that hard. Anyway, enough of me. Come on, now let me show you what I've got. My little treasures I'd love to share with you. Okay, guys. So in our discussion today about should we repurpose or not, the main thing to keep in mind, and I know this might be new for some of you, is number one. When you go into a flea market, or you go into an antique mall, or antique shop, or estate sale, or whatever, please don't automatically think of the things that you're going to see as craft supplies. Try to change that mindset. Try to start to think, what thing might I find here that has some value? That I can sell, or if I'm going to repurpose it, then I can leave it in as much of its original state as I can. And I will show you a little bit of why that is a good way to think in this video. I've had some videos kind of like it before, 
but um, as you might know, we're getting ready to do Response Word Purposing 101. Again, this year's a class I teach only once a year. And I just want to show the basics of how that goes. It might start you on a new journey, whether you get to take the class or not. Um, maybe help you start thinking a little bit differently. You know, when I teach this class live, which I've only gotten to do it a couple of times, one of the first things that I ask everyone in the class is, who needs more money to buy supplies, tools, show tents, pay, jury fees, pay show fees, stuff like that? And everyone's hand goes up. Well, sometimes that money is hard to come up with, isn't it? But one of the best ways that you can get it, besides making a whole lot of jewelry and hoping you have success at selling a whole lot of jewelry, is finding good vintage jewelry that's worth a little money. And believe me, it can be done. So that's another reason why, you know, you really want to train your eye to see what you can find that's of value that you're not going to tear down. You're going to sell it as it is for a fair price to somebody who collects or somebody who deals in this stuff because you'll make the money you need. And how do I know this? Because I did it. I did it. Over 30 years ago, I started out with a baby boy and no money and about $20 that I'd gathered together extra. And I was starting to pick vintage and learn a little bit about it by going to auctions and buying box lots and stuff like that. And I learned to pull out of those box lots or when I went out to flea market or whatever, pull out things that I thought might have some value, find out what they were, they were worth, and then turn them over. It was harder back then because we had to do it all by mail. So that's a whole different thing. And I'll tell you about it another time. but. Um, it worked out really well. It was when I, and at the time I was doing cleaning just to buy diapers and stuff that Jordy needed. And within a few years, about two and a half, three years, I was able to stop doing that. And I was making a very good li living picking vintage. In fact, some of the things that you see scattered around here are things I've had almost since back then. I kept them because now I have a case that I use for teaching purposes. So anyway, let, let's just talk a little bit about what I have on my table and why, whether or not it would be a good idea to repurpose it. Okay, let's see. What shall we start? Let's start with this. This is what I would call an ordinary rhinestone brooch. Very pretty. It's a um, smoke topaz. The stones appear to be machine cut, which is better than just molded. Um, they're all prong set, which again is better than just glued in. Let's turn it over and see if we can find out. There's no signature, although some of these stones are set open backed. Or, and the term is ajour. I don't speak French, but it's a French uh, saying that means with light or too light or with wind or something like that. You know, if you guys speak French, tell me. But anyway, that's the term. And it basically means that it lets light come through. And that's how these are set. Um, the pin back is set on really poorly. That is not the way to put a pin back on. So it kind of makes me think that maybe with some, someone with some basic soldering skill might have repaired it. But then on the other hand, I don't see any other evidence of that. So who knows? Maybe this is the way it came from the manufacturer. But anyway, would you tear this down and repurpose it? Well, what would you get for it? There's no name. There doesn't seem to be any special history, and it's not made that great. So I'm seeing you might get on a website or on your Etsy anywhere from 18 to 25 dollars being hopeful some of you are going to say oh, i won't even bring that i don't know i've sold vintage stuff along with supplies and my own jewelry on etsy for a while and i could probably get it i'd take a while though it'd take a while i was um 14 years on ebay too we were platinum power sellers so you know i've had a little experience with that too 
So I'm saying 1825. You might sell it for less. It might suit. You might never sell it because this color is not the best color to sell either. Although I love it, it was real me. So I would say on this one, it's your call. What you want to do. You're not going to be preserving history if you don't chop this up. But don't think that just because it has no signature on it, then everything you find that has no signature on it is, is fair game for cutting up and just go for it. It doesn't mean anything. It's not worth anything. That's not true. And I'm going to show you a case in point. I set this aside, and I'm going to pull this out. Some of you have seen me use this before. I did this on Facebook Live last week, so maybe some of you saw me then, but I thought we might get a little bit better video this week doing it for YouTube. Okay. Here's a case in point. Let's pull this out. Now, of course, this is a honker. I've got this stuck, but I'll, I'll fix that later. It's got a safety chain on it. It's broke. It's broken. See? It's missing one of these or something, or one of these, maybe. It's broken. Would I wear that the way it is? No, because, look, it's got a big hole, obviously. But you see, it's obviously got a big hole in it. So, okay, it's broken. It's not signed. Go for it. Chop it up. Anybody know what this is? Well, first of all, one giveaway is it's got what they call Easter egg cabochons. Now, I think in one of my videos I showed you kind of a way that you can kind of make something look like that with uh, embossing powders and stuff on the uh, mod acrylic uh, pearls as I sometimes throw in your free stuff bags. Um, these are actually, though, um, glass. And this is hard glass enamel, fired in a kiln. But it's got this uh, 50s, 60s look about it. And this is actually a 60s piece of jewelry. And I'm going to tell you what I know. Um, so those are very special anyway. You see stuff that has Easter egg cabochons, take pause. Stop. Flipping it over. The construction methods tell us clearly that this is Juliana. Juliana made a lot of pieces with these colors and Easter egg cabochons. You can collect them. There's a big bib necklace. There's a smaller necklace. There are several pair of earrings, a bunch of brooches, other bracelets. They had a whole big line of this. I really don't know what the name of it is, but some who collect might. But again, you've got the open-backed rhinestones. Now, this doesn't necessarily, because it has open backs on it, mean it's Juliana. I can't in a million years believe this is because of the way it's made. This is made so much better. But anytime you see something made like this, you have Juliana. Here's another case. This piece is missing. It's down. Actually, I think it's down in my teaching case. It's just, I think it's down in my teaching case. And I could probably fix that anyway. But um, pretty molded glass stones. Same kind of class. Turn it over. Here you go. It's Juliana. Back when I picked... I found lots of things made like this, and I had no idea. Up until into the early 2000s, most of us didn't know about the Liz and Elster or Juliana jewelry. Um, it wasn't made for a long, long time, but it's very, very, very avidly collected now. And even broken, you will get more money for it or a quicker sale than you'd ever get from something you made. In fact, some collectors know of jewelers who are skilled at repair, and they might be able to put that piece back in there. So what would you get for it in broken condition? This big old bracelet? Uh, 50? Seventy-five, possibly? If somebody was looking for this piece of completed perar, they might get it. Um, for this one, what would you get? Uh, go find the stone, put it back in, and then you'll get probably 45 or 50 for it. Depends on your market. You may beg to differ with me. This is my experience. This is what I would hope to get, and I think I would. Maybe not, you know, immediately, but not too long. That's still reasonable. Or maybe, you know, if you have some room, say you go somewhere and you find this for $5, which you could, because it's not signed. People aren't looking for that. They look for stuff with signatures. You know, so say you sell it to somebody for thirty dollars. It's a bargain then for them, and you still made a fine profit. 
and you could put that on a new set of good pliers or a pair of pliers. Okay, so remember these backs. This is Juliana. You find stuff made like this, you do not want to break it up. But I should preface this all with one big statement, and I forgot to, so forgive me. Number one, it's your jewelry. So if you tear it down, that is your business. No one should give you a hard time because you did. Although, if I saw something that you did like that, I might have to cry. I still have to acknowledge it's your business. It's your jewelry. If someone comes to you, uh, one of your customers, and they want you to repurpose something because they wouldn't wear it as is, um, and you know it's worth money, you might want to let them know first and then let them decide. If they say, have at it, because I want this made into a piece that I'll wear, I will not wear it this way, then that's their call, you know. But just keep in mind, know what you have. Don't just start chopping. Know what you have first. Okay, let's, let's go on a little bit more. Let's take the Juliana out of the equation. Here's another piece of really beautiful rhinestone jewelry. It's part of a whole line of jewelry that Coro made back in the 50s, early 60s. When Javi saw this in my stash, she immediately said, ooh, what's that? Light sapphire blue. I don't know if it was completely all laid out nice, but anyway, you get the picture. Um, let's see. Is it missing any of these little doohickeys? Hmm. Maybe need to be one here. No, it's not there. I don't know. I have to look at it again. The only other thing I can find wrong with this is it's it's got a baguette. A baguette. Right here. That's a baguette. These these uh, rectangular stones. In case you didn't know that, it's a baguette. B a g u e t t e. Baguette. Reminds me of bread. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is imitation rhodium plate, which they used a lot back then. This is a gorgeous necklace. If you can put it back in original condition, um, or make it look like original condition, you might get $8,500 for it to the right person. I don't have hardly anything in this. I bought it at a house sale. And it was broken, so possibly that's why they didn't ask for much for it. But <clears throat> I've had this for a long time, and I haven't done anything with it yet. I need to repair it. I'm moving on down the line, if I can. Even if I can't find, I think, yeah, I think that's broke off. Another little dingly dangly thing here. I, I would just sell it as is. I would not tear this up. Selling it as is with a piece missing, I might still get $25, $30, dollars, maybe more. For that, I just don't see where it helps you to tear it down, besides it's beautiful. But that's my opinion. So now you know when you find something like this, start looking for tags, because this is really well made. Anytime you find something really well made, start looking for signatures. All right, you know, here's the thing too. If somebody has the other pieces from this line, because Coral made a line like this, they might buy this even damaged because this piece is probably hard to find. So there you go, okay? So now I went to that down. Now here's something curious. This doesn't look like much, does it? This little roll gold bar pan, and it's got a damage in it right here. It's kind of torn. Somebody jerked on it too hard. Roll gold is kind of like gold fill, but it's got a little different look to it. Um, it was kind of like gold fill. Anyway, you can see it's got the old pin stem, the old style. No, that's not just a safety pin. That's how they made it back then. You can see that whoever had this loved it a lot. It's a little bit loose, and it's bent. Um, that is not a problem. That's not coming off. It's going to be fine. But here's the thing about this. Before you would go and start doing something with it, when I look at it, and I don't think it's going to really show up in here, it's turned the right way. Like, can you see the little mark in there, guys? It's a patent mark. It says patent June 5th, 1877. Now, I don't know about you. This is damaged. You can see the damage in here, too. 
But it just seems to me that since this is still wearable and it's still quite lovely and it's lived that long, way, way, way over a hundred years, maybe you should leave it alone. Maybe you should just enjoy it. Keep it for inspiration. I wouldn't tear this up. But like I say, it's your call. If you were going to repurpose it somehow, um, I would try to, you know, close the pin stem and do it through the pin stem so that um, I glue anything onto it or solder anything onto it. Uh, maybe beat up around this way, you know, catch it over there, and then maybe hang some stuff from here, make a necklace maybe. And that would be fine. You'd be preserving it the way it was. But 1877, can you imagine? That was just into the late Victorian period of jewelry design. There were three. Did you know that? Yeah. We learn about that in response to repurposing. Each one has a different look to it, too. When I look at this, I know this is late Victorian because of the way that it's kind of not, it's not carved, but it's kind of engraved. Someone probably did that by hand. Okay. Let's go on to the next thing. Okay, now this kind of doesn't look like much, does it? I think maybe take those flowers off there and put them on something else. It might look a little better. Let me show you something about this. This is put together with like, um, first there's wire going through here. Get some coming out there. And then these little, well, not nails, but some kind of a mini bolt. And the back is put on with a mint too. It's not, it's not glued on. That's a really big sign that you might have a decent piece of acorn when something's constructed like that. Also, another thing to look at. Hmm, might have big light. Look along the sides and you'll see kind of vertical slash marks that comes from the rod and from the carving process and you'll see that in big light a good bit. Good bit. Um, you can see it inside here also. Also the way that this is carved is kind of like slash um, carving. It's not it's not round delicate carving it, it never is a big light okay and then too you do the semi-chrome test um and we'll learn more about that in class and you're able to tell it's big light now i've handled so much of this stuff i can't say that i'm 100 percent right all the time but i'll tell you what picking this up if i was in a flea market or at a sale or something like that pick up, i know this is big light i know it i've handled ton of it. This is Bakelite. Also another thing you can do if you're out in the field and you don't have a way to test it is get some friction on it like this. Good friction. Heat it up. And then smell your thumb. Yep. You'll smell formaldehyde. <laughs> formaldehyde sign. If you've ever smelled that Bakelite smell you will never forget it. And you get that that's one way that you can bring it up. You smell that. You don't need some chrome. You know you have Bakelite, period, the end. Okay, anybody that's ever burned a Bakelite handle on an old pot? Oh, Lord. Let us know. <laughs> okay, so that's Bakelite. Now, now, have you heard the Bakelite cherries are really collectible? Well, yeah, they are, but this isn't Bakelite. So you might get all, ooh. You know, you might go to sale. Maybe you might spend a little bit too much for this. No, this is from the 30s, and it's some sort of composition plastic, but it is not big light. It is quite lovely. It's a dress clip, in case you don't know what this binding is. It would go, like, on your sleeve, maybe. Let's see if you can get this in the frame. Okay. Yeah. Not that you'd wear it there. Usually you wear it on like the notch of a lapel or in the corner of a neckline, on a hat, on a belt, on a purse. They're fun. I love dress clips. Actually, this might have been what they call shoe clip because it's got the little barbs on it. 
Not a fur clip, though. It's a dress clip. I'm looking to see if I see a patent number. If you ever see a patent number on one of these, it's usually the patent number for the fur clip or the dress clip, though. It's not for the piece, generally. Generally. Of course, you'll know if you look it up. But anyway, I bought this on Etsy a while back because I loved it for $8. That was a bargain. That was a good deal. I would buy it again over and over again for $8. If I sold it, I would hope to get about 35 so that would be a good turnover. I don't know that I'd get more, but I think someone would give me that that was collecting. Um, if I wanted to make this into a necklace really bad and I just could not help myself, I would pull this up and put my chain right in here and put this, pull this down over it. And then, yeah, you could do that and you wouldn't hurt it a bit. And it would be another fun, wear, fun way to wear it. But that would be the only way that I would repurpose it. Okay, so that gives you an idea. Here's another thing. Woohoo! Pretty, pretty, pretty. I found us some crystal in the flea market this morning. Paid five dollars for it. How many of you done that? I've done it a lot. I have a big drawer full of this stuff. <laughs> I have my limit. I won't pay any more, and that's it. Um, how about do I repurpose this? Well, this is very nice machine cut lead crystal. It's from the 50s. And it's got the crystal AB finish on it. Um, I don't know that you would get a lot, a lot of money to sell that. People, you know, if, if you bought one that was made by Swarovski nowadays, you'd pay a whole lot of money for it. But for the old ones, they just don't seem to bring enough. Especially when they're short, chokery type things, and there isn't any earrings, and there aren't isn't a bracelet. There's nothing extra special about it except these beautiful beads. So would I break this up? I probably would. I probably would. Because there's a lot of stuff in here to make beautiful accents on a lot of jewelry that would help that jewelry to sell better. And buying this stuff, you know, new, it would just cost so, so, so much more than that. So in this case, unless it's signed, if it's signed, think twice. Don't, you might not want to do that if it's signed. But um, if it's not, it's your call. Some of you may say, oh, no, 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 don't. But um, I think in this case, you're okay because it is not signed. Now, here's another example, though. So then you find one, and it looks like this. Now, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of really beautiful dangles on that. A lot of great-looking pairs of earrings. It's got some really pretty bead caps on it. It's all machine cut. Crystal AB, it's not scratched up, very beautiful. It is signed, however, it's signed Deauville, and there is a pair of earrings to go with it. I paid $15 for this. Here's a signature right here. I don't know, I never did look it up, Deauville, D-E-A-U-V-I-L-L-E. -E. Maybe I'll go Google that, I really should. Um, I've worn this a whole bunch of stuff. I used to have this beautiful green brocade suit. It was like the kind of suit maybe you'd wear to somebody's wedding, you know, fancy. And this looked like the bomb with it. Um, don't have a suit anymore, still have the necklace and earrings, and it's going to stay with me, and I love it. I only paid 15 bucks for it. As for whether to cut it up, well, I'm not cutting this one up, but it'd be your call. I wouldn't. But then if you sit and you think about how much money could you make if you tore it down, as opposed to leaving it intact with the earrings and selling it, what would it go for? I don't know, tops 45 50 maybe? Maybe a little more, maybe a little bit less. And the sale might not be a quick sale. You might make more to cut it up. I don't think the name Deauville is a widely collected name, but then again, I have not looked it up, and that's another thing. We need to look stuff up. Don't just assume, oh, I never heard of it, it's not worth anything. No, look it up, check. But I think at the end of the day, we want to preserve history, but at the same time, we need to make money. We need stuff so we can be 
better designers. So in a case like that, maybe I would, but I'm not going to. Okay, let's put this aside. What about this hunk of junk of ugly, ugly lobster neck, uh, uh, lobster um, pin? Ooh, he's shaking. He's got the palsy. <laughs> <laughs> he's shaking. Oh, that tells me something. Let's turn it over. Do I see a mark? I never have found a mark on this guy. I bought him a long, long time. He is pot metal, and he has a gold wash over the top, and then red enamel that's in very poor condition. It's really dinged up. I don't know if you saw it. Let me lift it up. Let me see. It's really dinged up. It's missing a couple little sparklers. That'd be easily repaired. But he's a trembler. I think they call it un -tremblant. There's, again, French, which I do not speak much. But it means trembling, trembler. Um, when I see a big figure like this that's heavier, the first thing I want to look for personally is a mark from the company, the Boucher company, B-O-U-C-H-E-R. No, it's not on this one. I don't think this is an unsigned Boucher either. Um, but that's the first thing I would be looking for if I picked this up, the old Boucher mark. Because if it has that, this is a payday. The old Boucher figurals, some of them are worth big, big, big money, more than you could dream. There's a, I think it's a praying mantis, if memory serves. I'll have to look it up again with the Boucher mark. They didn't make very many of them at all. If you find it, that is a big, big payday for you. Big, big payday. So when you find these big, ugly pins like this, hesitate. You might want to make a little collection of them. I paid $40 for this guy, which might seem like a ridiculous amount of money, but for me it wasn't because I loved it. And for me, this is a piece of history. And I'm sure that if I went to sell it, someone you know who loved vintage jewelry would probably give me my money back. I don't want to sell it though. So, But anyway, just saying, when you find very large figurals, especially ones that tremble, You want to stop and think hard before you do anything bad. Here's something. Now, what I think about when I first look at this is that this might be a piece of late 80s to mid 90s QVC jewelry. It's got the matte gold finish. That was very, very popular back then. A lot of jewelry had it. Nice department store jewelry. And this is probably department store jewelry, but what kind of department store jewelry? Hmm. Well, it's very well done. Here's the mark. Do you see it? It's in script. K-L. What's that mark? Anybody know? This is Carl Lagerfeld. Carl Lagerfeld. Look him up. Major, major, major designer. Big time. You find Carl Lagerfeld jewelry, that could be a payday for you. This guy, the last time I looked it up, was going for around $275. I paid $6 for it. It's all about knowing what to look for. So learn to be a jewelry detective and find out. This is mine. That's mine. This has been mine for a good 20 years, and I love it. But yeah, I paid six bucks for it. I remember that well. Okay, here's something. This looks like a bunch of uninteresting plastic beads, right? Isn't that what it is? Go ahead, chop away. It's almost like seeds or wood, because it's got these little imperfections in it. Little marks. It's really light, though. It looks like it should weigh a lot more than it does. I mean, that's really, really lightweight. Hmm. Well, it needs restrung. That's old string. Huh. Well, where's the clasp? I see it. Oh, 
This is it. Now, how am I going to... I know where this bit of grass. Sometimes they screw together. Let me see. That is a big sign that you probably have amber. And these are for a fact amber. There are many ways to test amber, but I haven't tested this. I don't need to. I know it's amber. It's deep dark butterscotch amber. That's, I don't know. 18, 22 inches. I didn't measure it. Um, that's not real, real important, Amber, but I certainly wouldn't take it apart. Now, if I found this coming apart, all apart, I might sell the beads together as is, sell them. Or maybe if I wanted a couple of them, I'd take them out, use for me, and sell the rest. Um, but this one, somebody else can restring it if they want to. I could probably get $95, $100 for that, maybe. Maybe a little less if I want to sell it quick. Um, I don't think I would get a lot more. But maybe I would sell a little bit, because I don't have anything in this. I found this in a bag of junk in a flea market. And that's where you find a lot of amber. I have found good faceted cherry amber that way, because people, you know, they're cleaning out a house, and you don't know what they have, they think it's just plastic. You throw in a bag with a bunch of trashy stuff, and there you go. Another way to find uh, good stuff is you find a lot of cultured pearls that way, too. So whenever you buy a big bag of beads, be checking it for amber and for cultured pearls because you may well find them. So no, this was not one to tear down. What about this big, big charm bracelet? That looks pretty special. Would you take that apart and do something else with the charm? Well, you could. You wouldn't hurt it. Actually, um, it's kind of put together a little bit wonky. It could probably need a little bit of help to get this everything going, you know, better. Some of these are sterling. Most of them are just brass with plating, but they're all hand painted by an artist by the name of Kim Jelly. And she was one of the first ones that did this a lot at eBay. And she was a doll artist of some note. And she came to us at the website and she decided that she would like to uh, well, I've sold a lot of that Dresden enamel then. She bought a lot of it, and then she said, you know what, I could do that. So she started, and she tried. And she just painted with acrylics and went over the top of the Biotech Select resin. I've had this for hmm, 18 years or more, maybe. Maybe not quite that long. But, I mean, it looks like she just gave it to me. You know, like I just got it. There is a little tag on here somewhere. I don't know exactly where right this minute. Yeah, here it is. And she has hand signed it. So if you find something like this, look for this. Kim Jelly. She got so good at this that she was able to get um, sometimes $600 for just one of the hearts. Now, these aren't that kind. Did she was able to paint in miniature. And she would paint cherubs and things like that. And they brought a lot of money. I don't know if she's still doing this or not. But if you're out there, Kim, hi. I still have the brace and I love it. This was the only only the second one she ever made and I treasure it. I would never take this apart. I don't wear it very often because it's kind of heavy, but that does, I don't care. It's just wonderful. It's a wonderful piece. Okay, so let's push this up here. What's this? This is Bakelite? This Bakelite colors. It looks kind of slashed like Bakelite. Well, this is clearly glued on. You feel all over this. Oh, there's a lot of fingerprints in that. You know what? This is an artist piece. This is polymer clay. <laughs> is it worth anything? Well, only to somebody who really likes it. You know, I didn't do it too much. I made this a long time ago, and I really liked it. I made it about 20 years ago. And I really, really liked it, and I really, really kept it. <laughs> so there you go. Here, I really, really kept it. Now, what about this guy? Is he worth anything? Well, he's wood, and this is inlaid and then glued. This was somebody's craft project, too. They did a lot of stuff like this back in the 40s and 50s. I have a whole collection of these gaudy little wooden 
hand painted pins that somebody made. And I am nuts about them. I would never do anything with them. Um, they're worth, I think I spent two dollars to get this guy. And it can still happen because people don't, you know, if it's not signed, they don't know what to do with it a lot of time. Um, so, I mean, you could make something from it, but like that. Her big cuff bracelet. I wouldn't. I would say, let me keep that guy and collect some. And then if you get a bunch of them, like, you know, a collection of three or four, sell them all together. And it's a ready collection for somebody and get more money for it. I wouldn't sell it. That's me. Okay, so what do I have here as a bug? People love bug jewelry. Isn't uh, this damaged a little bit? Well, it's got a little ding in the pool there. That's sad. Nope, that was dirt. Woohoo! Never just mistake dirt for a ding. <laughs> this is actually, though, there's a mark, and it's Coro Sterling. So that, let's see, it's Coro Craft Sterling. Yeah, it's Coro Craft Sterling. Okay, that means it's worth even more. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's not dinged up. He just needs clean. This is Verme over Sterling. Verme, V-E-R-M-E-I-L. It's just like a gold wash over Sterling to make it look like it's gold. And he's very clever. He's very um, late 40s, early 40s, or late 40s, early 50s look. And he needs clean. I see dirt in there too. He's a dirty bug. <laughs> I love him. I would never, never, never do something with him, and you guys shouldn't either. You find something that you find something like this for eight, ten bucks while you're out there scarfing around, and you could, you really could, um, clean them up, and you could probably get seventy-five or eighty, and that's conservative. A uh, quicker sale would be fifty. I go for the quicker sale, always. Because if I'm not keeping them, let's let somebody else have them and get the money. Take some of that out, go buy something else to sell, and use the rest to develop my craft, my uh, jewelry craft room. Get uh, more supplies, get more tools, stuff like that. All the stuff that I do in jewelry craft today came from doing this. Every last bit of it. Until I started selling the jewelry on me, then, you know, there you go. What about this? This is kind of messed up. There's no signature on it anywhere. Nothing. What do you think? What could this possibly be? Any ideas? Is it anything? I mean, it's not... It's a little wonky. Well, this is a nice piece of unsigned Haskell. So this stays with me. I found it in a bag full of junk. What it's worth, I really am not sure. Maybe a collector would give me 60 75 in this condition for or more. Um, I wouldn't sell it for less. I liked it. When I find the pieces of a Haskell that are kind of wonky and messed up, then I figured that's my excuse to keep them and learn from them. And there's a lot to be learned from this. You know, go back to my caging videos and you'll see, you know, you, you get a few pieces of old Haskell or bits and pieces of it and you can just learn so much. There's just little Baroque glass, Japanese glass pearls wrapped around this bracelet form. Raw brass, probably not even plated. That's early Haskell. Not, well, not so early as it's just not signed. It's before when they were signing them. Very pretty. I don't know. Could I wear it the way it is? No. Well, I have to have somebody hook that up for me, but I can't know what it looks like. There. Yeah, I could wear it. I could wear it. No rose Montes, he was. So, yeah, it's wearable. It's just wonky. Wonky but wearable. No, don't tear that down. Okay, here's my last piece, guys. Those of you that saw the video live at Facebook last week know about this as I put it in there. Um, this does have a signature R. 
J. Clues, which that would be an artist. Um, it's hefty. It's copper underneath. Oh, look. It. It's fired on both sides, too. Pittsburgh, PA. This is a little curiosity piece. I would never tear something like this up. Never. Um, let's see. This is the um, trolley that goes up the incline. Here's down by the rivers. Um, this is Steel Mill. I think this is um, back when they had Three River Stadium, maybe. I'm not entirely sure what that is. But anyway, um, I don't live too far from Pittsburgh, so you know, you find some Pittsburgh mem memorabilia around here. That would be someone who loves Pittsburgh, comes from there, would love to have that. And it is a quality piece, quality artisan made piece. Very easy to wear. Very, really cool. Super cool. What would I sell it for? Well, I, I can't even put a value on it. I would say because it's an artist's work and because it's so well done and I appreciate what an artist do, I might put $150 on it. I don't know that I'd do it. It depends. Maybe somebody knows that artist and collects their work and would be delighted to pay. I don't think I want to sell it for less because it's so one of a kind and so wonderful that, you know, and we find stuff like that. Take pause, throw it back in the dresser drawer, keep it for a while until you can learn something about it. Or enjoy it and wear it. And don't be in a hurry to do something. I really don't even know how you repurpose this to make it look right anyhow. So unless maybe you took one piece and made it, you know, each piece and made it into a separate. Yeah. I'll leave that one alone. That's wonderful. Okay, well listen, I'll bring all the stars of the show back out. So you can have a look. This all belong to me. Like I say, I keep them in my teaching case, and once in a while I get them out and I wear them. And I love each and every piece, and it's all they are all parts of my journey. Some of them go back really far with me, and some don't. But they're all very, very special. Some of them I've spent, this piece I spent $100 for. But here's my advice to you. When you're new at this, don't spend more than $5 for anything. If you can help it, unless it's a big box of jewelry, in which case, you know, divide it out and it's whatever it's worth it. But if you don't spend more than $5 for anything, how hurt can you get? And then if it turns out that it isn't anything, then you can repurpose it with wild abandon. Chop it up. Have fun. But there isn't anything here that I take apart, especially except for these. And the rest of it. I will keep or try to find a collector. So that's how I feel about that. And to wrap all this up, to just let you know, um, once a year, I mentioned it, I teach a class on Facebook called Responsible Repurposing 101. And in that class, we learn to triage a box of old jewelry. So you got a bunch of junk, you don't know what you have. We learn how to pull it apart for value. We learn how to become jewelry detectives. We learn how to sell, find out what it's worth and how to sell it and use the right terminology to sell it. We learn about all periods of jewelry, starting with Georgian period, which was right around the time of late 1700s into 1800s, up to the three periods of Victorian. We learn about Art Nouveau. We learn about arts and crafts. Now, there's a hard one. Arts and crafts gets mistaken for so many other things. And I'm not talking about arts and crafts like scrap poogie. <laughs> I'm talking arts and crafts period jewelry is quite wonderful and quite valuable. Um, we get into art deco. We get into art modern. We get into the golden age of costume design and the designers from that period. We get into some other forms. Uh, so we talk a little bit about buttons. And we talk about newer designers to be watching for new designers of note. We talk about just all kinds of things. We talk about Bakelite, the old plastics. There's going to be a nice section about the old plastics in the class and I'm going to do it by video and that video will not be here on YouTube. It will be part of that class and will remain part of the class. So I'm not going to be doing another you know, video on YouTube um, to explain what these things are because that's part of my class and the class takes two to three months to finish. Depends on the students in the class. Each class is different. It's not held in real time. 
So you can come when you're able to. We just put, it's like a, a Facebook group, but it's closed. And um, you can come when you're able to. There's a lot of reading. There, we use uh, Janine Bell's 8th edition old jewelry and warmints. We refer to that a lot of times. Um, I send you out with links. There's a glossary, and there are many learning modules which I have written, and you can print them out to save them if you are part of the class. They're for the class use only. The class costs ninety-five dollars for new ones. If you've taken it previously, it's sixty. You might say, "Oh man, that's I could buy a lot of jewelry for that," and you would be right. But do you know what you have? How fast do you think you're going to learn this stuff? If I only could have taken a class like this back when I started, huh, I would have been in heaven. I would have forked that money over so fast. Back then we had no books, we had no Google, we had no nothing. Just whatever contacts we could make in the trade. You know, um, we do have a lot more now to learn from. Um, so if it's the class isn't on your radar, then please stop when you see something you don't know what you have and Google it and try to figure it out. When you know the period of jewelry that it comes from, or perhaps the designer, or you know a little bit about it, it makes it so much easier to find stuff up and, and out about it and find out the value of it and just get it on its way. And it also enhances your knowledge, so it's a very good thing to do. If you're interested in taking that class, um, it starts September 5th. This is August 31st, so we're coming right up on it. But there's still time to sign up. I'm going to take sign-ups all through this coming week, even once the class starts to the weekend. You won't miss that much. You can still get in. So if you have to think about it, you know, take time to think about it. Um, it can be paid by PayPal or credit card. You can call us 1-800-868-4393 during business hours. We're here 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday. And we're here Sundays on 2.30, 2.30 to 9. Uh, so uh, feel free to do that if you're seriously interested. Or you can contact me at Facebook, Brenda Sue Lansdowne. Do you want me to put a link for your class or for your sign-up? Mm -hmm. There really isn't a page to go to to sign up. Okay. Um, I'll just link you then. You can, yeah, you can, yeah, you can link my page and they can, they can message me, Facebook Messenger, or there's the phone, you can give me the phone number, 1-800-868-4393. Um, call if you're interested. I can't really take conversations just to chat um, about it, but if you have questions and you need to chat about it, that would be fine. You call me. Okay. Alrighty. And if you're seeing this beyond that time frame, I don't teach it again till next summer. So keep it in mind, okay, guys? All righty. So you guys have a great day. I hope maybe this weekend you get out to do a little bit of junking. And when you do, think about what I said. Don't think of it as crafts, materials. Think of it as money in your pocket. Okay? All righty. Bye-bye.